Yeah, thanks. All right, yeah, thanks, Simon, and uh, thanks, everyone, for being here. Um, just so I know, can you raise your hand if you're an undergrad? OK, at least a few. All right, so I, I tried to put some intro slides in here. Uh, hopefully, it's not too technical, but please like stop me and ask questions at any point. If I say something that doesn't make sense or and your question's allowed to be like, what's going on, that's fine. Uh, all right, yeah, so uh, yeah, as Simon said, I'm a national fellow. Uh, I get here a lot of Fridays, so if I haven't met you yet, uh, you can come find me like tomorrow or other Fridays, uh, hopefully during the year. Uh, I'm working with uh, currently Matt Johnson, who is a, a joint York uh, PI faculty. Um, and there are also other people who have contributed in some form or another uh, to this work. Uh, so Diego Contreras is another postdoc at York and PI. Uh, Juan Caiso, a grad student at PI, and then uh, Glenn Starkman is a professor at Case Western, uh, actually my thesis advisor, so some of this work is gonna be based on uh, work I did back then. Um, Tom Giblin, who's a faculty at Kenyon College, and then Chi Tian, who's a grad student at Case Western. So it's uh, kind of the credit slide, I guess. Okay, uh, but I'd, so I'd like to start off by uh, dividing cosmology into like a few kind of semantically distinct areas, and this is really just to draw a circle around the particular areas I'll be focusing on, which are in relativistic cosmology. Um, but yeah, let me start out with uh, observational cosmology up here. Uh, so this is you know, the study of what exactly do we see in the universe, and where do we see it, and what's it doing. Um, so in particular, uh, we see that our universe is expanding, and we see that on large scales in particular, it looks homogeneous and isotropic. Um, we also uh, have physical cosmology, which is kind of the study of what is in the universe and how does it uh, kind of interact with itself and how does it evolve. Uh, and so, you know, basically given this expansion, we can infer uh, different constituents, uh, different components of our universe. So we infer some amount of cold dark matter. We infer some, something that looks like dark energy. And we infer some uh, baryonic content. Uh, and then there's relativistic cosmology, which is the study of gravity uh, in particular on the largest scales. And so it's the study of you know, how does all this matter gravitationally interact? And also importantly, how do observables, uh, for example, photons, as they propagate to us, they propagate through a metric. Uh, how does this metric affect the properties of those photons or other observables? Um, okay, so given these three things, we have all these ingredients that kind of make up our standard cosmological models. Uh, so a lot of cosmology focuses on you know, what is dark matter and what is dark energy. So what are these two, uh, uh, you know, two things that comprise our universe and uh, how do they work? Um, what I'm gonna be kind of focusing on today is rather uh, this particular assumption that goes into a lot of our models. Um, so instead of asking what is dark matter or dark energy or something like that, uh, we observe that the universe is homogeneous and isotropic but then this assumption is kind of, um, we, we kind of use this as an assumption and bake this into our cosmological models. Uh, so for example, we have perturbation theory in which we perturb around a, a homogeneous and isotropic background. And so uh, what I would like to do is essentially relax this condition and try and probe uh, essentially whether it is true and whether anything unexpected happens if we can try and drop this assumption. Okay, uh, so cosmology 101, hopefully this is something you're familiar with. Uh, when we say homogeneity and isotropy, what do we mean by this? Um, by homogeneity, we mean the universe looks the same everywhere, no matter where you are. And by isotropy, we mean it looks the same in all directions. So if I have some space-time patch, um, no matter where I am, or no matter what direction I look in in this patch, uh, everything looks the same. So there's a single length scale that describes how our universe looks on large scales. Uh, and so if I you know, kind of demand that there's just the single length scale that describes our universe, I plug that assumption into Einstein's equations, out pop the Friedman equations, and that tells us how this length scale uh, behaves as a function of time, and also how uh, essentially the rate of expansion of that length scale uh, behaves as a function of time. And so it's you know, self-sourced and then can also be sourced by whatever matter components we have in the universe. Okay, and of course, uh, we know the universe isn't perfectly homogeneous and isotropic, so uh, you know, perhaps the simplest thing to do is just uh, say, okay, what happens if we have perturbations around the scale factor? So um, here I'm kind of breaking homogeneity. I'm, letting, uh, I'm allowing these perturbations around a homogeneous and isotropic background. Uh, I can take this assumption instead, plug this into Einstein's equations and linearize. Uh, and out, oops, uh, out again pops uh, the Friedman equations at zeroth order, 
than a first order, we end up with something that more or less looks like Newtonian gravity. Um, all right, so here come the buts. Uh, so this, pr these particular equations have restricted the form of the metric, right? We've demanded that the metric look like this. And then we've also uh, linearized the theory, but fundamentally GR is a nonlinear theory. And so we can ask, are there nonlinear corrections to the behavior we see when we use models that look like this? Okay, so uh, more specifically, we have you know, all sorts of non-Newtonian behavior that we commonly study in cosmology. Um, so for example, we have you know, different so-called scalar vector and tensor modes, uh, essentially you know, frame dragging effects, gravitational waves, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, we also have these light cone projection effects. So you know, the influence of the metric on light rays as they travel to us, and this encompasses things like you know, time delays or gravitational lensing. Um, and this is good. I'll talk about this a little bit later on. Uh, so we also nonlinearly have uh, essentially entire classes of new effects that uh, we might have to worry about in principle. Uh, so there are uh, beyond, leading or beyond leading order new contributions to cosmological expansion. Uh, so for example, we could ask, well, do gravitational waves contribute to cosmological expansion? Or we could ask, uh, okay, so in principle there should be some interaction energy between dark matter particles. Maybe that interaction energy is really weak, um, but there are so many pairs of dark matter particles in the universe. Maybe these interaction energies add up to something uh, that's kind of macroscopically appreciable. So uh, is there anything, any sort of behavior that leads to uh, sort of uh, new physics that we haven't, uh, that we don't typically consider? Um, Okay, so if, if we you know, neglect uh, some of this additional nonlinear physics, uh, we can, uh, you know, different, different sort of problems can arise. So for example, we might have some exact average expansion rate as a function of time. Um, and we might have some FLRW model that doesn't correctly describe all the nonlinear behavior that's going on. And we can match this, for example, at late times, but maybe at early times, uh, this doesn't provide a perfect description of what, our, of what the uh, average um, universe is actually doing. Uh, or we could cook up kind of the other model where it agrees at early times and then at late times it's not going to be a, a great description. And so we'd like to know uh, essentially how, how big of a problem is this in, in nonlinear GR. Okay, uh, we also have things like the gauge dependence of averages and perturbations. Um, so I have to say what exactly I mean by average quantities. And when I take an average, usually I'm averaging over some spatial foliation. And so I have to worry about uh, in different coordinate systems, maybe uh, at one foliation that does one thing, and then maybe at another coordinate system it does another thing. And so does my average expansion rate over these different spatial slices look the same? Uh, and in general, uh, no, they will not look the same. So uh, the you know, precise behavior of what my average expansion rate is doing in say co-moving synchronous gauge can look different than what my uh, average expansion rate is doing in Newtonian gauge. Uh, Okay, so we also have to be careful about how we ask questions. Uh, and there's a similar story with the perturbations. Um, so there's actually a, a good example of this that showed up on Archive uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, this was a paper by like Tim Clifton and Rob Sussman. Um, so uh, they consider what happens if you have a universe that's kind of tiled with like a vacuum, and then they put a uh, kind of a slab of dust, and then vacuum and dust. Uh, what happens if I want to describe this universe? So I you know, fill the entire space time with like, tiles of these things. Um, what I can do, I can perturb around the vacuum solution, or I can perturb around the dust solution. And if I perturb around the vacuum solution, I'm kind of treating the dust as perturbations. If I perturb around the vacuum, or sorry, if I perturb around the dust, then I'm treating the vacuum as perturbations. Um, and in either case, at least at linear order, they find uh, uh, there's no so-called back reaction or no really effect. <laughs> on what the background is doing. Um, and so, uh, I mean, this is a problem if I want to know the large scale properties of my universe, but I get to choose the background, then, well, what am I really learning about the large scale properties? Uh, so we, we would like to have a better, or a, you know, a, a good way of thinking about what I mean by uh, things like averages and what the behavior of the perturbations actually is. Okay, uh, and lastly, we also have non-commuting operations. Uh, limits and averages are two examples of these. Uh, so for example, if I consider what my FLRW model uh, is doing, so say I measure luminosity distances as a function of redshift, and I match that to some uh, Hubble model, or some uh, FLRW model, that's not, at least at second order, gonna necessarily be the same model I would infer uh, had I done the same thing with 
know, a, a different distance measure. And so this is also something we have to worry about. Okay, so there are two kind of questions I'm going to focus on here. Uh, the first one of these is can we just see um, these sort of uh, average FLRW-like laws uh, pop out if we have full solutions to Einstein's equations? And then also, are there, um, you know, assuming an FLRW model plus perturbations is a good model, kind of a nonlinear order, are there any new observable consequences? Okay. Uh, any questions so far? That's my introduction. Okay, um, all right, so uh, this talk is kind of divided into two parts. Uh, the first part deals with the first of these questions. Uh, how do, you know, how can we try and see these, this large scale expansion arise uh, just by, you know, putting initial conditions down and that's it, making no other assumptions. Um, so the first part of this talk is gonna be methods, uh, essentially numerical relativity sims, and then results looking at properties of our space time uh, in these sims. Uh, and then the second part of the talk is going to be focused on observables. So uh, we can compute the metric, but ultimately the thing we see in the end will be observable quantities. Um, so, so part two will be a, a discussion of that. Okay, so more generally, this is my uh, lightning introduction to Einstein's equations. Uh, what I can do is, so earlier I had this scale factor and I demanded that this be the same everywhere and in every direction. I can promote this to a matrix quantity that's a function of space and time. So I have, uh, I can describe length scales in different directions and at different locations in my space time. Then I can do the same thing with the expansion rate. Uh, and this thing right here is called the, the three metric or the metric of my spatial hypersurfaces. And then I also have the uh, expansion rate or the extrinsic curvature on these hypersurfaces. And so if I plug these two things into Einstein's equations, now I end up with a full solution to Einstein's equations. This is the most general thing we could do, essentially. Okay, so how do we solve this? Uh, this is a joke, don't actually do this. Um, <laughs> so uh, so uh, what we can try and do is ask Mathematica, you know, I have the most, what, are, what do Einstein's equations look like given the most general metric? Uh, we can, you know, not, not even ask for a solution, just ask what did the equations look like? Uh, and, you know, it sits on here and hangs and doesn't give you an answer in any reasonable period of time, so. Uh, all right, so we need, we need something better. Uh, so what we do is borrow tools from numerical relativity. So this uh, formulation right here is called the BSSN OK formulation. Um, so this formulation was uh, first, so the, the first two initials here, Baumgart and Shapiro, uh, notice that this particular form of the equations that these other authors, uh, Shibata, Nakamura, Ohara, Ohara Kojima, uh, had been using uh, this particular decomposition of Einstein's equations let you evolve strongly gravitating systems. And this system of equations was one of the first ones that was used to evolve uh, colliding black holes. Uh, so this system of equations has all these wonderful stability properties and all these wonderful numerical properties that we can take advantage of. Um, the, you know, the, the hard part, of course, is in performing all this algebra, but really it's not any worse than, say, if I wanted to you know, do a second order calculation, well, I still have to track all the degrees of freedom, I still have to do all the algebra anyways, so. Uh, at this level, I can just get a full solution to Einstein's equations and, um, and, and run with that instead of doing some sort of perturbative expansion. Uh, okay, so, the, so here we have, again, the variables we just looked at. We have this three metric. Uh, I've pulled out a conformal factor in front of the three metric here. Um, uh, you know, pr precisely what's going on here is not that important. Just suffice to say it's for uh, reasons of numerical stability. Um, so this, this uh, field here is kind of like the log determinant of the metric, or it's related to the volume element. Um, and then we also have the uh, expansion rate, uh, or the, the extrinsic curvature. It's been broken into a trace part and a trace-free part. So we have that matrix, and we just split out these two components, and we have all these separately. Um, then we also have, uh, of course, uh, matter sources. So we can have some density, some pressure terms, uh, some anisotropic stresses. Um, we also have, in blue here, I have all these different gauge terms. Uh, this is essentially something you get to choose. So you get to choose uh, how your you know, four-dimensional space-time has been broken into three-dimensional slices. And so you get to pick uh, what's called the lapse and the shift, um, basically how my slices are oriented relative to each other and how far separated they are in time. And so uh, if I were to work in co-moving synchronous gauge where this lapse is just one and the shift is zero, then all these blue terms just go away and the equations simplify quite a bit. Um, 
but you know, this is pretty general, so I can work in any gauge as long as I include all of these different terms. Right, so numerically, uh, we take these equations, we discretize them, we solve them on a grid. Um, so we consider what the metric and matter uh, fields look like at each point in our space time. Um, and then we can, you know, we have all these derivative operators, so we just compute derivatives based on what the metric at nearby points is doing. Um, and then we have some scheme for stepping forward in time. And so we can integrate these equations exactly. So this is generic also in the matter project? You have yeah, you can put in whatever stress energy source you want. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in cosmology, the two things we'll be interested in uh, for matter sources uh, will be collisionless matter and uh, something that looks like a cosmological constant. Uh, so there are two different ways we um, can evolve collisionless matter. We can consider first just a plain hydro sim, or we can also consider like a full GR n body sim. Uh, so if I want to do an n body sim, what I have to do is take the geodesic equation and write this in a form uh, that makes use of these variables. Uh, and so I do precisely that. Um, so this is the geodesic equation written in a you know, particularly convenient form in, a, in this uh, three plus one language. Um, so, we can, so we can see the you know, Newtonian geodesic equation kind of pop out of these. If I uh, treat the shift as zero and I ignore this like V squared term, then I'm just left with this uh, you know, d velocity d time equals this stuff, and so I have a gamma factor in here, like a relativistic Lorentz factor, and then I also have a derivative of the g zero zero component, which is just one of the Newtonian potentials, and so this is just you know the geodesic equation, but generalized torque in any gauge. Um, okay, so I can evolve n body matter using these equations, and so you know put down particles in my space time and see how the space time uh, you know evolves in response to these particles. Uh, if, I want, if I want to have a hydro formulation, I can do the same thing, or, or a, a similar thing. Um, so I have uh, essentially a density variable, and then some sort of momentum variable. And so this is just you know, essentially tracking the rest density times some metric and Lorentz factors. And then the, my momentum variable is just uh, you know, velocity times that density variable. And these are written in a nice you know, convenient form for numerical integration. Um, and then cosmological constant is just, is what it is. It's just uh, row equals lambda. So that one's it's, you know, very easy. Okay, uh, so let's say we've, um, you know, we've taken these equations, we've uh, uh, coded them up. We of course want to test our code. So how do we do this? Um, we want to essentially explore solutions to Einstein's equations in uh, different regimes where different energy contributions can dominate. So I can consider regimes where sort of like the curvature dominates or say the expansion rate dominates or other terms. Um, so this equation is one of the constraint equations from general relativity. So GR gives us these in addition to the equations of motion that I showed earlier. Um, so you know, this is my, we, we have tested our code slide kind of. Uh, so we can you know, plug in a black hole solution, a Schwarzschild solution. We have you know, some data and some analytic solution plotted under it. And we can make sure that our simulations are you know, actually giving us the Schwarzschild metric if we put it in and try and evolve that space time. Um, we can also plug in gravitational wave solutions. And so you know, we uh, put in a gravitational wave, run it through a box you know, hundreds of thousands of times and make sure that the, uh, the metric looks, again, analytically and numerically uh, just like it should. Uh, and then we can also consider cosmological space times. Um, and so we can consider the FRW solution. Uh, so, I mean, that is an approximate solution, but it's still an exact solution to Einstein's equations, at least. Um, so we can consider what our space time looks like if we have uh, um, just some expansion and some matter in the universe, and then uh, look at the residual of what our code, of, of um, our numerical solution versus the analytic solution and see that, okay, great, these residuals are very small. Are you using this constraint equation as a test, or are you enforcing it in the evolution? So, so it's, yeah, it's not being enforced in the evolution. The evolution is purely just integrate these equations. Um, so this, yeah, so this is our test. Uh, this needs to be obeyed. And so we put in, in initial conditions where this is obeyed, but then we're not going to enforce this. We're just going to let the system evolve and then basically ask, well, how well has energy been conserved? Um, and we can do the same thing with momentum, but I'm not really going into that here. Okay, and of course, for any uh, numerical code, always check for proper convergence. Uh, so when we wrote down 
our spatial derivatives. We had to discretize our space time. Um, so we had to uh, you know, write down some approximate uh, uh, formula for derivatives based on the metric at nearby points. And we did this you know, in principle to some order. So our code does this to eighth order. Uh, and we should make sure that as we change, you know, as, as we increase our sampling on the grid, that our uh, solution accuracy scales in this particular way. And then we can do the same thing with the time stepping. So uh, when we integrate the uh, BSSN equations or Einstein's equations, we just use an RK4 integrator, which if you think back to your computational physics course is hopefully a, a phrase you remember. Um, and so we can check that as we uh, you know, decrease our time step, as we take finer and finer uh, time steps, that our solutions converge uh, as they should here. Um, and then one more detail for n-body solutions. We have this other peculiarity, which is kind of uh, empirically determined, that the number of particles we have uh, per grid cell actually needs to tend towards infinity. Um, and this essentially lets us recover the fluid limit. So if we didn't do this, if we sent our grid spacing to zero, but didn't send like the number of particles per cell to zero, then we find essentially that uh, constraint violation can be violated or that we end up with like just a bunch of black holes sitting in our space time and that's not really a fluid, so. Okay. Uh, all right, but of course we're interested in, uh, in homogeneous cosmologies, so not the idealized solutions we just looked at. Um, so more generally, this is you know, essentially how do we set initial conditions in our code? Uh, we have, um, so in essence, we can plug in whatever metric we like, it doesn't matter. And then we can just solve for the density fields algebraically. Um, so we can use the metric that corresponds to what the, um, um, what, the, what the metric looks like given cosmological perturbation theory or Lagrangian perturbation theory or whatever theory you want. As long as we have the metric and we pick some expansion rate for our initial hypersurface, uh, then we can just algebraically solve for what the density is doing. Okay, and so this is exactly what we do. We pick initial conditions that are at least consistent with linear theory, but then sort of nonlinearly completed uh, just by uh, algebraically solving for whatever the nonlinear corrections are to linear theory. So we correct our density field by just a little bit. And we can do an analogous thing with the velocity field and the momentum constraint equation. Yeah. When you run a simulation like this, do you start with the standard embody tools for generating Um, for the, okay, so, d uh, depends. Um, so in a lot of the early work we did, it was just, uh, let's put in a Gaussian random field that has the correct, or you know, some pseudo-correct, uh, that produces some pseudo-correct Gaussian random density power spectrum or something. Uh, we haven't really got, we haven't really tried to do something more correct by putting in two LPT initial conditions or something, even though in principle you can. Um, yeah, so, so, so essentially it should be uh, something that's consistent sort of with linear theory, um, but maybe we could nonlinearly set slightly better initial conditions. Um, yeah, so, so every, I think everything in this work I present is just kind of at high redshift, initialized according to linear theory. Um, but then of course we need to satisfy this exactly, and so I'm solving for uh, what the density and velocity fields in particular uh, should actually be. If that makes sense. Okay. Um, Okay, uh, so we run this code. Uh, we immediately run into some issues. Uh, fortunately, these are kind of resolvable, but these boil down, unfortunately, to uh, sort of physical issues that we can't just uh, um, you know, increase the resolution or something to get around. Uh, so first of all, things get noisy. If I have you know, some particles uh, sitting in my grid, um, but then they're, say I have a void or something and these particles are vacating out of the void, then all of a sudden I maybe perhaps have undersampled my density field. And in full GR this matters because if I'm resolving individual particles, then um, in principle, I'd, you know, I'd, eventually these things are gonna collapse and form black holes or something. And so this, uh, this noise can be particularly problematic. And um, uh, so we need kind of a remedy in order to reproduce a smooth density field without this particle noise. Uh, there are also physical divergences, acoustics. Um, so whenever I have a stream crossing, so I say I have matter fall into a potential well, as soon as you know, it kind of hits itself, then I'll form a caustic or a stream crossing. And there are actually physical divergences, like the, the density, like T 
mu mu, like the trace t, like the actual density field diverges, the covariant one. And so this also means that the curvature terms are going to diverge. Uh, so I wind up with these infinities and say I want to evaluate my uh, conservation of energy equation and see um, exactly how, uh, how well energy has been conserved. Well, then I have to like subtract off two things that are infinite and then, okay, I can run into problems this way. And this isn't really a problem for, uh, say, Newtonian codes because there we're, uh, in some sense, explicitly enforcing the Hamiltonian constraint equation. Uh, that was sort of what gave us uh, uh, Newton's equation. Um, and so there, there, it's not as important, but in this case it is. Okay, uh, so uh, just a quick note about how we remedy this. Um, we have, uh, one thing we can do is uh, interpolate additional particles. So we have some particle distribution. Um, we know, you know, we can track where these particles went, and then we can just uh, stick in additional particles in the space between wherever the particles are. So we can increase our sampling in this way, and this helps uh, alleviate noise. Um, with regard to these uh, divergences, there are, uh, well, okay. Uh, and then there are also reference formulations, which um, uh, this is essentially COLA for GR. So I can su subtract off, um, and if you don't know what COLA is, this is essentially in uh, like Newtonian gravity. I can subtract off um, an approximate uh, solution to what my particles are supposed to be doing and then evolve the differences. Uh, I can do exactly the same thing in GR um, instead of just Newtonian gravity. And, and I can evolve, uh, say, a difference metric or something instead. Um, and this just uh, essentially helps reduce numerical round off error. And then there's another thing I can do, which is uh, adding constraint damping. Um, so my, I'll have some numerical violation of conservation of energy. Uh, and that violation will actually obey its own equation. And so uh, what I want to do is make sure that violation obeys some sort of damped equation. So the violation uh, goes away. Um, so I can add these uh, things called constraint damping terms, which uh, affect the equations I'm integrating such that we try and you know, remain on, surf on surfaces where energy is conserved. Okay, uh, so those are just, I don't know, details of the method. Any questions about that anymore? Yeah. So just the big picture, you're studying in high redshift and you're evolving all the way to do that? Yeah, that's the idea, yeah. Where high redshift is like uh, redshift 100 or so, like not back to where we have radiation or something, though. Oh. Yeah. Uh, so so high high redshift, but still matter dominated, because uh, all we're putting in these sims are matter in lambda. Okay. Uh, okay. So simulation results. What exactly do? Um, uh, so, so so what do we see when we put in these initial conditions? Uh, so what, what can we check? We can check what the average expansion rate looks like relative to the FRW1. Uh, and here I've used some essentially volume weighted definition of average. So I have um, an expansion rate at every point in my space time. And I also have a volume element. And so I'm just volume weighting my expansion rate. And then I can integrate over my entire volume that I'm uh, simulating. And then I can check uh, how well this corresponds to an FLRW law. Okay. Uh, so as I noted earlier, there's a caveat to this. So that average is going to look different in different gauges or in different coordinate systems. Uh, so here I'm going to consider three different coordinate systems. Uh, I'm going to consider something that's sort of Newtonian. Uh, so by Newtonian, I mean close to isotropic. Um, by isotropic, I mean that the expansion rate looks the same in pretty much every direction. Maybe it varies spatially, but uh, in different directions, it looks the same. And so I can enforce that condition by uh, setting this trace-free part of the expansion rate uh, to be zero. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have enough gauge degrees of freedom to enforce this exactly. Uh, so instead, I can work with this condition that uh, I'll attribute this to like Bardeen's 1980 uh, paper on gauge invariant variables. He suggests this as an alternative. Uh, and so we can enforce this condition instead, which tries to minimize the amount of uh, distortion or shear that our hypersurfaces uh, experience as they evolve. Um, we can also uh, use a different slicing called harmonic slicing. Uh, and this is uh, what's known as like a, a, driver, um, a driver condition for constant expansion. Uh, so what we do in this case is, as our space time evolves, we sort of dynamically relax to a solution that has a constant uh, a spatial expansion rate. And so this is sort of as close to homogeneous as we can make it. And there, there actually is an exact statement here. I could enforce that k is uh, constant everywhere. 
um, but that requires solving an elliptic equation, which is more expensive numerically. So that's uh, so we're just going to use this approximate condition instead. Uh, but so it's close to homogeneous. And then lastly, we'll consider co-moving synchronous gauge. Uh, in this gauge, the, um, the the metric essentially tracks what the matter is doing, and so my velocities will uh, initially be and always be in the simulation zero. Okay, uh, so. Now we can compare results for these three particular coordinate systems. What do we come up with? Okay. Yeah. What about the boundaries? Uh, so, yeah, I guess I didn't really say. Um, so this is a periodic box. Uh, so I'm enforcing periodicity of essentially a Hubble size volume. And you're going to look at a subset of that volume? Or? Uh, I'll, I'll just um, integrate over the entire volume. Okay, but it's, it's fixed in physical distance, physical size? Uh, n n no, I mean, I, well, I, it's, it's fixed in, I don't know, simulation units, I guess, uh, but the physical size can vary, right? I mean, in principle, it expands at least, so I have, um, oh, yeah. In the usual case, it's fixed in code size, right? Like yeah. regular and Right. Yeah. So normally you have the uh, fixed co-moving size, mm -hmm. but you don't have a co-moving size. In this. Yeah, there's there's no reference to like a background cosmology yeah, with exactly. which to define co-moving. Yeah. Um, I mean that this should behave in much the same way. Like I could probably pull a scale factor out and see how that behaves. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, but yeah, I don't know. That's uh, I don't know. It, it says constant in simulation units, whatever those are. Um, yeah, but the, and then and then it'll follow some FLRW-like law, uh, which is essentially what we see on this slide. Okay, so this is uh, how well our expansion rate is obeying an FLRW-like law, and this probably tells you, you know, to what extent the volume of the box is scaling, uh, like the scale factor. Um, okay, so in these three different gauges, uh, we see that this kind of maximally homogeneous and maximally isotropic gauge. Uh, you know, back reaction or the difference between this model and an FLRW law, uh, this is really tiny. This is like a part in 10 to the 9 or something. Uh, so, um, well, okay, that, that's not very interesting. Uh, but in synchronous gauge, things look quite a bit different. Um, so this uh, line here actually, so, so the reason I haven't um, uh, continued this plot, uh, so here I'm plotting, uh, yeah, I guess I should say what, sorry. Um, Right, so, so what, what I'm plotting here is essentially what the expansion rate is averaged over a volume as a function of some length scale. So I uh, fix what my box initial size is, and then I um, put in just a, a single sinusoidal perturbation in that box, the amplitude of which corresponds to the amplitude of a mode of that length scale in lambda CDM. Um, so on like gigaparsec scales, I have some amplitude modes uh, in this box, and then on uh, you know, 50 megaparsec scales, I have a, a different amplitude mode. Um, okay, and so the, okay, and then I'm looking at the expansion rate uh, as a function of, you know, this length scale then. And so we can see in co-moving gauge, as I go to smaller and smaller scales, um, uh, you know, linear theory, or uh, we're seeing, you know, an increasing difference between our FLRW model and the, um, the average properties in this volume. Uh, and this uh, cuts off here instead of continuing to go, just because uh, in co-moving synchronous gauge we actually run into coordinate singularities when we have stream crossings. Um, so in synchronous gauge, if we're if we're trying to track the velocity of our particles, but two of them run into each other, then we can't continue integrating in this gauge because the our coordinates would have to cross, and uh, and our equations don't permit that. Um, Right, so, so in any case, this, this cuts off at some point, whereas in uh, Newtonian and harmonic age, I could continue this down to smaller and smaller scales where the density perturbations get larger and larger, uh, and this line pretty much continues, even though I haven't shown it on this plot here. Um, okay, so we do seem to be uh, uh, seeing an FLRW-like behavior uh, on average here, uh, at least for these two gauges, but not for a synchronous gauge. All right, and then also do we reproduce uh, linear perturbation theory around this background? Um, so how do we ask this question? Well, we can consider what happens when we look at the trace-free part of the spatial component of Einstein's equations, or if you like, you can think about this 
and Newtonian gauge as how well does phi equal psi. Uh, so we're essentially going to test this condition and see to what percent accuracy uh, this condition is satisfied. Um, and again, precisely, so, so this is the Newtonian gauge statement and synchronous gauge. The statement will look a little bit different. Um, uh, but in general, what we're doing is seeing how well this expression is obeyed. Okay. Okay, and so again, for the same simulations, we're putting in some modes with some amplitudes corresponding to lambda CDM as a function of length scale. Um, and then we're asking, okay, what's the fractional violation of this phi equals psi equation? Uh, so essentially, what is phi minus psi over like the amplitude of the perturbations in phi? Um, okay, and we see that in again in harmonic and Newtonian gauge, uh, uh, you know things are kind of at second order, exactly where we expect them. But in co-moving synchronous gauge, uh, we see this you know this kind of blow up this non-perturbative behavior. Uh, so this is telling us that on small scales at least. Uh, perturbation theory is not going to tell us, uh, at least very accurately, what the synchronous gauge metric looks like. Okay. All right, um, but it can uh, nevertheless tell us what, in some, you know, homogeneous and isotropic gauges, what the metric looks like. Okay. Okay. Uh, any questions about this? And then I want to move on to ob observables. Yeah. Yeah. So you compared the behavior in certain gauges to the results of your simulation. Mm -hmm. and so does this? What does this imply for someone working this code with a gauge? Does it imply that people should not ever work in this gauge analytically because it gives the results that don't what you actually see here? Uh, it, it implies that if I want to know what the metric is in co-moving synchronous gauge, then uh, it, yeah, then if and I use linear perturbation theory, then I'm not going to correctly identify that. And I think there's, there's probably an analogous statement in Newtonian gravity, like I need to keep track of the coordinate transform between Eulerian and Lagrangian coordinates, and that's like a nonlinear coordinate transformation that I need to perform to switch from one coordinate system to the other. Yeah. And so this, and, and in principle, this can have, right, so, so I guess there are two potential implications. One um, is when I consider, you know, what, when I compute observables, I want to consider what class of observers I want to have. So if my observers are co-moving with the fluid and have experienced some fixed amount of proper time since like the Big Bang, uh, and those are physically relevant observers, of course, then um, I need to make sure I'm you know, doing things correctly and nonlinearly in order to uh, model exactly where those observers are. Um, yeah, but if I have you know, different observers, then maybe I don't have to worry about that. Uh, did someone else? Okay. Uh, any other questions before I keep going? Okay. Yeah. So, so, so all of that. I mean, those are properties of the metric. Uh, the metric we don't observe directly, of course. So we want to know what are the properties of the observables. Uh, so, what do photons look like as they come to us through an inhomogeneous spacetime? Um, and are there any sort of nonlinear effects we can think about that are observable in, uh, in, in the more general GR case? OK. OK, uh, so uh, there are kind of two parts to this. Uh, I'm going to consider two different sort of uh, classes of corrections. The first of these will be things that we think about in linear gravity. And if you've been to the Seed of Blackboard talks, this will be kind of a recap of those results. Um, these will be uh, what we call light cone projection effects, so essentially trying to take into account things like time delays or gravitational lensing and what um, um, and, you know, the propagation of our photons as they travel from a distant galaxy to us. Um, and this is you know, encompassed by linear theory. And then we can do the nonlinear thing and ask, uh, well, how well do our linear calculations work? And of course, at some level, there will be a correction. Um, how large is that correction, and is it relevant for observations? Okay, so uh, this is kind of a technical slide, just saying what we do exactly when we compute observables. Um, so the optical scalar equations are these first two equations. These essentially tell us if I have a beam of photons uh, traveling through a spacetime, how does the area of that beam behave? Um, so in an FRW spacetime, I have what's called uh, Ricci lensing, and I don't have YL lensing. Um, so Ricci lensing is just lensing due to matter, and YL lensing is sort of tidal lensing. Uh, 
So Ricci lensing will just cause like an overall growth or, or well, really, I guess it just focuses beams. So it'll, it'll cause an overall uh, shrinking of beams as they travel through space times. Um, uh, but if my beam is traveling in vacuum as opposed to uh, uh, through a distribution of matter, then I'll also have, or then, then I'll have only uh, just this pure tidal lensing. And so my beam can sort of shear or deform uh, in a different way. And so together, these two effects uh, both affect how I infer angular diameter distances. Um, so when I measure an angular diameter distance, I'm asking what angle does an object of a particular physical size subtend? And so there will be some beam of light you know, between an observer and that object. And we're just tracking essentially the area of that beam of light as it travels from the object to us. OK, uh, and then we can also um, Right. Okay. And, and in general, uh, both you know, both Ricci lensing and YL lensing in a general inhomogeneous universe will contribute. Uh, but at linear order, this YL lensing just kind of comes in as a, a second order correction. So uh, you might be able to think of this as like shear as a second order correction to your magnification or something. Okay. Uh, so we can also compute redshifts, of course. You know, provided we pick some uh, source and some observer, we know their velocities. So we have a galaxy. Uh, at least in the simulation, we know its velocity, and we have our observer somewhere. We say they're following the fluid, and so we know what their velocity is. And then we can exactly compute uh, what a redshift between that source and observer would be. And so this accounts for uh, as long as we you know, integrate a photon vector along a null geodesic uh, from the source to us, then this accounts for all the, relative, all the relevant effects, so you know, the you know, Doppler effects and lensing, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. All right, so in linear theory, when I do this, uh, I can, and in Newtonian gauge in particular, I can decompose uh, these terms into um, uh, you know, different physical effects. So uh, one observable I can think about is you know, the number density of galaxies. Uh, so you know, consider an observer, just look at a patch of the sky, how many galaxies do I see there? Um, there will be some intrinsic density fluctuations, and these will, this will modulate the number of galaxies I see. Uh, and here we're assuming, so, so these are like dark matter only sims or calculations, and so we're assuming some bias model that gives you uh, a galaxy number given some underlying dark matter density perturbations. Um, so we'll have those intrinsic uh, density perturbations. We'll also have lensing effects. So lensing effects, you know, if I'm magnifying a region, well, then I'm, uh, I'm doing a couple of things. I'm, not, I'm like, uh, decreasing the number density of galaxies in that region. Um, I can also have RSD effects. So you know, this, these effects, uh, and it's some, like the Doppler contribution, like I miss them for the redshift of um, where a remote galaxy is. And then there are all these uh, kind of additional Doppler effects and additional gravity terms that come from performing the full linear calculation. And so these first three effects are pretty commonly considered. These other effects, uh, less commonly. Fortunately, CAM in class will compute all this for you. So if you just ask for like the number counts power spectrum, uh, these codes will give it to you. Um, but if we're interested in asking, you know, if we consider at least the intrinsic density of perturbations and these RSDs, kind of Newtonian and special relativistic effects, uh, and we ignore lensing because lots of people have put a lot of thought into that. How well can we detect these uh, sort of like next order contributions? Uh, and so this is just a plot of the angular power spectrum of number counts as a function of multipole, uh, given some assumptions about bias and uh, you know some assumptions about I'm going to measure the galaxy as an enriched have been near one, et cetera. Uh, so what do these fluctuations look like? Um, so here we see that uh, so these are these are measured in differences relative to the underlying density of perturbations. Uh, so we have some contribution from RSDs, which is this red line, which can actually dominate over the intrinsic uh, density of perturbations. Um, and then we have uh, lensing, which is this black line. And so these plus the intrinsic density perturbations are all uh, the dominant effects. And so uh, you know, if you take all these three things into account, you're, you're doing a pretty good job. Uh, and then there are all these subleading contributions. Uh, so from you know all these you know, gravitational potential terms, time delay, et cetera. Um, so each one of these has their own phenomenology, but they're you know a couple orders of magnitude down from the intrinsic density of fluctuations. Okay, uh, and then one thing one might worry about is well, if I have these um, 
you know, these, these effects and I don't properly account for them, uh, am I mismeasuring any cosmological parameters? And so we can ask, well, is there a cosmological parameter that these effects are degenerate with? Uh, and it turns out non-Gaussian entities is one of these things that it is uh, kind of degenerate with. And so, um, so here you can see this non-Gaussian curve is this green line. And I can see that, oh, if I had ignored, you know, some of these GR contributions, maybe I would actually think I had some non-Gaussian entities, even though uh, maybe in reality there's not one. Um, okay, so will ignoring these GR terms bias constraints, uh, in particular non-Gaussian entities, but more generally of any other cosmological parameters? Are these effects uh, yes, so, it, well, it depends. Um, and body sims, I'm not super sure about. Uh, if you're using camera class or something, then yeah, they should be, yeah. Okay, uh, so how, how precisely do we do this? Uh, can we measure these GR effects and what is the amplitude of this bias? So there are a number of ingredients that kind of go into our modeling of how well we can uh, describe this, um, or how, how well we can detect this. Uh, so what we essentially do, we have some number counts perturbation. It's you know the sum of all these different effects. We can put a parameter uh, out here in front of just the GR terms and ask how well can I constrain this parameter. Um, so if I can, so this parameter is nominally one, and so if I can measure this thing with an uncertainty of less than one, then I can say, oh, uh, I've detected you know all these GR contributions. Uh, so I can try and constrain this parameter or forecast my ability to constrain this parameter in future experiments. Um, right, yeah, so, so there are a number of things that go into this, uh, which I'm not really gonna talk about, just a bunch of different biases, assumptions about uh, how the galaxy maps, to the, how the galaxy distribution maps to the dark matter distribution and how that galaxy population is evolving in time. Um, uh, you can, I don't know, I guess look at this paper for more details about all these things if, if you like. Um, Okay, uh, but what are these constraints? So if we just use galaxy number counts by itself, we don't really get interesting numbers. So we get some constraint on FNL that's you know quite large, order 10, and we get some constraint on this GR parameter that's order five, so uh, not super interesting. And then we have some bias in FNL, but this bias is smaller than our uncertainty, and so maybe we're mismeasuring FNL a little bit, but it doesn't really matter because uh, you know, our, our uncertainties are much larger than that bias anyways. Okay, what happens if we add in uh, CMB data? Um, so now we have some, uh, you know, well, the uncertainty in all these things decreases, of course. Uh, still not super interesting. Uh, now what happens if we add in KSC measurements? Okay, things start to get a bit more interesting now. Uh, I have uh, kind of an order one uncertainty on FNL at this point, and I have an order uh, two bias in FNL. So now I might start to worry that at this level of precision, um, if I don't, if I'm not accounting for these GR effects, my measurement of FNL is biased. Uh, and the uncertainty in the uh, GR terms is now less than one, so maybe with some marginal significance um, uh, measuring relativistic effects. Okay, and then one last thing I can do is include, so, so all of these forecasts, uh, you know, I haven't added any other information besides we just see perturbations in our number counts or CMB field on some range of angular scales, um, but I haven't added any additional information. So now, yeah? Is this thinking that you have the observations in a single redshift slice? Uh, so this is assuming uh, I have observations in some number of redshift bins between like zero and three. Um, so I think these numbers assume you have like 30 bins. Uh, so our, our bin width is like redshift three divided by 10 or something. Yeah. Yeah, so this is, uh, so these numbers also are kind of optimistic in that they, they assume full sky coverage, but um, as for the number of galaxies, we kind of put in a magnitude cut and we end up with like a number of galaxies observed that corresponds to like a number of galaxies, at least per steradian, that uh, some, an experiment like LSST should be able to see. What's, what's the role of linearity in uh, this? This is pure linear. Not nonlinear comes next. Sure, so, so yeah. you cut non linear space? Uh, well, so the whole thing okay. is linear, but you don't observe the linear power spectrum, right? 
And as you get closer and closer to pressure zero, the nonlinearities will kick in at, at lower particles. Uh, yeah, that's right, yeah. No, th this is this is well. We uh, we don't cut anything, but we, I mean, this this is just a pure like we're just using the linear matter power spectrum when we make these forecasts, and so it's not it's not a nonlinear like we're not we're not accounting for anything nonlinear. Okay, so uh, at uh, all this information is constrained using like L of order sixty or less, so it's it's large angular scales. Yeah, but the constraints on the other parameters will come from the. From everything that's beyond the mass uh, so, so, well, the constraints on like the standard cosmological parameters, those mostly come from the CMB. Um, oops. Uh, constraints on uh, these other bias functions, and well, it, so, so uh, the GR and nonlinear, uh, and sorry, uh, non Gaussianity effects uh, come into play on large angular scales, um, and so these are. You know, not constrained by like very high multiples where we expect nonlinear effects to dominate. So yeah, I mean, I mean, m most of the information uh, we get in constraining these two things just comes from information on linear scales. Is that? So I mean, in a nutshell, is it true that the extra power you get from the CMEs just putting priors on the standard? <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. Right, yeah. Um, yeah, one, one caveat to that. So we have, when we've done this forecast, we've also like included cross correlations between uh, the CMB and uh, like the KSC and number counts effects. So, uh, but, but only on low multiples. So we essentially have a prior from like L of 60 and above on the standard cosmological parameters. Yeah. Um, okay, and so, so we can also add in this uh, a prior or assume we have additional information about this particular bias function. Uh, so this is the evolution bias, which tells us how the number of galaxies uh, at a you know, given location evolves as a function of time. Uh, so on this slide, that was uh, this one down here. We're just you know, asking how the average number density evolves in time. Uh, if we put a 10% prior on this, so say we know what the average number density of galaxies is as a function of redshift to 10% accuracy or so, um, then we come up with other, we, we come up with a considerably better number or constraint on this, uh, these GR terms. Um, okay, and so this is, you know, like a 10, 11 sigma uh, potential detection of relativistic effects. And then for non-Gaussian entities, now we have some uncertainty and some bias. Uh, the bias is considerably larger than our uncertainty now. And so we, now we might start to really worry that if we don't account for these things, uh, if we don't account for these like home projection effects, then we're really gonna, we might misinfer uh, uh, some level of non-Gaussian entity that's not really there. Okay. Uh, all right, and then as kind of a last thing uh, I want to discuss is, is now, can we use our full numerical relativity sims to do something similar? So we have a full linear answer. Um, we have a linear forecast. Can we get some sort of forecast using our uh, nonlinear sims? And so what's nice, so, so essentially what we do, we can run a GR sim with uh, very small amplitude perturbations and uh, and you know, then second order corrections should, uh, in principle, be much higher, at, or like at a, at a much smaller order, and then it can scale the perturbations up by some factor. Um, so formally, the linear limit should correspond to doing this type of operations, where I decrease the amplitude of my perturbations and then increase them back by the same, uh, by you know, the inverse factor. And I can do this to sort of whatever components of the simulation I like. So I can linearize just the metric and the metric evolution uh, without touching the matter. So the matter can behave fully nonlinearly, and then I just have the linear metric evolution, and then I can compare uh, essentially how large these nonlinear metric contributions are, uh, and kind of independently of whatever the light cone projection is doing and whatever the fluid is doing. Uh, and so this is uh, this is like exactly the kind of operation I want to do in order to pick out metric effects. And so in general, uh, I mean. As a technicality, this calculation is still going to be gauge dependent. Uh, if I'm doing like a full nonlinear matter evolution, um, uh, just because the amplitude of you know the, what, what the matter is doing depends on how accurately I've modeled the metric. Uh, 
And so if I have a gauge in which perturbation theory doesn't work well, like co-moving synchronous gauge, and I linearize the metric uh, there, then I'm going to have a very inaccurate metric that I'm telling, that I'm feeding into my matter. Um, so I'm not going to look at synchronous gauge. I'm going to look at, in particular, harmonic gauge uh, for making this prediction. Um, because there we think we're, you know, we're still in, from the early results, it looks like we're still in a weak field limit where perturbation theory should be working well. And we should get an answer that is of a similar order of magnitude to uh, Newtonian theory. OK, and so I'm not, yeah, I'm not going to give you forecast numbers yet. I'm just going to essentially show you the equivalent of this plot and how large my corrections are. Uh, so yeah, so just just for reference, uh, these you know dominant GR corrections were like percent level, and then we had like you know ten to the minus three level uh, terms in there as well. Okay, um, all right. So from from a simulation standpoint, uh, how do we do this? Uh, what we can actually do is run our sim forward in time, and we can run it backward in time just as easily. Uh, that's that's fine. Um, so we can run our simulation forward from you know redshift say a hundred until now put an observer somewhere in the simulation, and then ray trace along all geodesics as we run the simulation backwards in time. Um, and so this is exactly what we do. And then we can compute angular diameter distances, redshifts, and we can ask along these null geodesics, what is the you know, rest dark matter density? And then once we have the rest dark matter density, we can convert that to a, you know, a galaxy number count. Okay, so there's still going to be some model that relates our galaxy number density to, um, to, to the underlying dark matter density, but uh, so, so we're not going to get rid of that assumption quite yet. Okay, uh, so here's a number counts density sky uh, in a box. So this is like a simulation that's order a Hubble volume, uh, resolves down to order you know, uh, tens of megaparsec scales. Uh, so it's, it's information that's pretty much just on large scales. I don't have uh, any real nonlinear uh, contributions here, but still I can ask this question. Um, OK, and we can compare the linear result to the full GR result. Uh, so it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't really change. You might, you might actually. <laughs> uh, so actually, if I toggle this back and forth, you might be able to see a little bit change. I don't know. You, you can kind of I pick it out. Lost the, oops. I don't know. Okay, yeah, so uh, more importantly, can we pick this sort of thing out statistically? Uh, and then I'll wrap up. So this is the, the last thing I'm going to show you. Uh, so in terms of the power spectrum, uh, I've averaged over a number of simulations, uh, say like 20 of these. Um, here I've linearized just the metric. Uh, I've linearized everything, including the matter fields. And then I've done a full GR calculation, or yeah, and then the, like the full nonlinear calculation. And all these different angular power spectra lie right on top of each other. Um, and here I plotted the residuals. And so if I linearize only the metric, uh, here I have essentially noise. I have that the, you know, the full GR power spectrum agrees pretty much exactly with the uh, power spectrum I get when I linearize the metric. So really, there's no, not going to be any detectable effect down here. Um, if I linearize everything, okay, well, now I have linearized matter dynamics and uh, linearized light cone projection as well. Um, well, okay, now, uh, you know, the amplitude of this creeps up to 10 to the minus 4 or so, but that's still, you know, an order of magnitude below that smallest linear contribution. And so it looks like linear theory is giving us a, a very accurate description of what's going on here, at least on these large scales. Uh, and at least in terms of the matter power spectrum. So the other thing I can look at is directly comparing the maps. So I have a map with you know, some number of galaxies per pixel in it. Uh, I can compare, again, the exact to the approximate thing in terms of the map. And I can ask what the difference between the GR and approximate calculations are in units of like the RMS fluctuation value. So this is essentially you know, the, the fractional contribution to the already small contribution of, um, of the number counts fluctuations. Uh, so my, OK, so, so if I linearize everything, uh, this number is actually not that small. It's not 10 to the minus 4. This is like a few percent level. And so my maps, the perturbations of my maps, the exact one and the um, approximate one are different at this 5 percent level or so. OK, and then uh, for the linear metric, uh, this number is perhaps not hopelessly small. Um, we're seeing like 
order 0.1% deviations between the two maps. Um, so my, uh, um, my, my exact map and my approximate map are agreeing at kind of this, uh, you know, point, order 0.1% percent level. And so this, I mean, this isn't, this doesn't seem to be showing up in the power spectrum, but because at the map level there do seem to be these differences, maybe there is some hope that some other statistic besides just the power spectrum can pick out uh, these, well, these relativistic corrections in particular. Okay. Um, but yeah, so, so this is all very preliminary. This is a work in progress and uh, not published yet. So um, I don't know, we'll, we'll see. Uh, this is all I can tell you so far. Okay, uh, so your takeaways. Uh, we do see corrections to kind of a perturbative models around uh, background, um, but we, you know, we do see small perturbations. And another takeaway is that approximate models will not always be uh, you know, sufficiently accurate for uh, comparing to observations. So uh, in particular, remember those light cone projection effects, those linear light cone projection effects uh, would give rise to this bias in our um, FNL parameter. Okay, and so a bunch of references up here, uh, if you like, uh, but that's all I really have, so. Maybe we have time for one quick question. Uh, <laughs> do, you, do you see multiple numbers and some large scales uh, at the map level? Oh, and, and the GR sims, uh, that's not something we've looked for yet. We, we haven't looked for that. I don't know. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh,